everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. I hope that this finds you healthy, resilient, powerful, moving forward. The market is absolutely on the move. And once again today in this podcast, I'm interviewing an entrepreneur, a rock star inside his business, and an impact player in the real estate space. Uh, if you are a real estate agent and you have a website, if you've ever shopped for websites, there's a pretty good chance you looked at Agent Image. Uh, John being one of the founders, I think it was last year, uh, Real Trends in the Wall Street Journal gave them basically the best web design. I, wanna, I don't wanna misquote this, the best overall website and the best web design which is pretty badass because it is a competitive, competitive space. So, uh, John, welcome to the podcast, man. Oh, thanks for having me, and uh, and thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So, so you know, obviously, we're not going to spend the entire time talking about websites here. Um, you know, we I always want to know like the backstory, how you got here, and then you know, look, we we are all navigating through this, you know, sort of three different crises simultaneously. We're going to get through all that stuff, and how is your business, and how are you guys doing? But, but maybe just for the person that doesn't know you, doesn't know uh, your background, before we talk about the business, who is John Crabb? Where were you born and raised? How did you get here? How did you start running this crazy successful company? And what did you do before that? Um, you know, I actually grew up in uh, Palm Springs, California, or Rancho Mirage to be exact, and uh, moved out to LA when I was 21. Um, and uh, was actually going to real estate. That was my intention. I had my license actually when I moved here. And uh, and John Arrow, um, as you all know, is that's uh, here in LA. He's my godfather. So growing up, that was sort of my mentor and who I looked up to, and I figured I'd follow in his footsteps and uh, and go that route. That was the plan. And uh, okay, so hold on, hold on, hold on. So so what most people don't know, John Arrow is a legend. I mean, on on in West Side LA real estate and really around the world, John is uh, like everybody knows sort of luxury real estate. John Arrow, right? Um, has built multiple companies, has sold multiple companies. So he's your godfather. Like, you want to give us some insight on that? Like, you know, that 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 sounds like a lot of pressure is actually what it feels like. Yeah, I, uh, my, uh, my mom and his mom actually met when they were very young and, and best friends forever. His mom actually turns 104 this year in uh, next month, actually, in July. So wow. she's an amazing, amazing person. And uh, I need to get her on my show, by the way. She's 104? phenomenal, Hello. sharp as a tack and, and amazing, amazing woman. And yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so growing up, you know, that was sort of who I looked up to and who I, uh, you know, my dad and, and John were sort of the, the people I, I kind of admired, work ethic, accomplishments, things like that. Um, both very self-made and, and very driven and just, uh, you know, so when I, when I came here to LA, that was the plan. I was going to sort of follow in his footsteps. And uh, I worked with him in the company for about three years um, while I was going to school here in LA. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, was, it was all sorts of things. At that point, he was just setting up the first few years of uh, John Aaron and Associates, the first company he had. So yeah. I would help set up the different offices, the Pacific Design Center one, the uh, Palisades office he had here, just different ones, and sort of do a lot of different admin type work while I was going to school. And uh, during that time, you know, I, I looked at the marketing stuff they were doing. It was brilliant. You know, that I always say that John's stuff was so ahead of its time yeah. when yes. it came to print, which was sort of the medium back then, that there was nothing really out there like it. And so um, during that time, they would move their marketing department around to different offices, depending where the energy was kind of low. So it was kind of interesting. They would actually take the marketing team and put them in all the different offices whenever they wanted to sort of boost energy and and uh, it, it was a really cool idea because it worked brilliantly. And during that time, uh, they moved to the Palisades office for, I think it was about a half a year. And uh, the person who was working there, James Wecker was the head of marketing, but uh, Tiger Batanga was his assistant director of marketing. And Tiger and I ended up becoming partners uh, along with Luigi. That's the three of us who started it, but we met there and uh, we would just kind of hang out. Uh, you know, it was the only person close to my age at that time. I was about 20, probably 22 or so at that time. And we were just kind of hanging out on breaks and stuff and talk. And fast forward two years later, um, when I finished school, I was working out of the, uh, his Canon office in Beverly Hills uh, as an agent there. And I was working with two other agents at the time. And the first thing they tell me, is, so we're getting this website built by this guy named Tiger. And uh, I said, you're kidding me. There can't be that many tigers. So I was like, uh, we just started chatting and I was helping design their site and, and working with them. And uh, I just, I just loved what he was doing. You know, it, it's, it was one of those things where he sort of felt like it was right at that dot-com sort of 
uh, I would say right at the top of it, right before the bubble burst, if you will. I was going to ask you, is this like 98, 90? Okay, we got to back up first, back up first. A lot of people are going to listen to this. You're going to be like, oh, God, okay, he's another one of those guys that like had every opportunity handed to him. It was all super easy. You know, my godfather's the legend of Los Angeles real estate, and he just plants me into all these easy gigs. So I'm making money, driving a Mercedes. Like, were you that full of shit during this whole time? Or were you, like, or is, or is the John Arrow that I know, was he just grinding on you? No, nah, he, he was, there was no, I mean, what we, how we started is, it's kind of that crazy sort of, I guess, tech company start, if you will, back then. It was August of 99 is when we started. And we had nothing. It was literally started off of my Discover card. We were working out of Tiger's uh, two-bedroom apartment at the time. Um, Luigi came into the fold right away because he basically, Tiger said, hey, I got this buddy of mine who's working for GE. And he's a contractor. He's between jobs right now. And he's going to join us for a couple of weeks and, uh, and uh, sort of help us get started. And of course, that couple of weeks turned into 20 plus years later now. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, we're working out of his apartment. And uh, that whole story, if you want to hear it, it's a, it's a crazy story, actually. We, I, I'm, actually su I'm actually super interested, but I want to go back to, to John Arrow. Yep. Was John tough on you or was he, was he babying you? No, no BS. Yeah, he was very tough. You know, it was funny. He was tough, but very helpful in the sense that yeah. I remember one of our first conversations with John. We went to get lunch and he, and of course, he knew Tiger so well, too. So it was Tiger, Luigi, myself and him. And we're sitting there talking. He said, I'm not going to tell you what you're doing right because you already know what you're doing right. He said, I'm going to tell you the mistakes you're probably going to make, hopefully help you avoid some of them. He said, but you're going to make mistakes, he said, and, you know, you need to prepare for that because he said, the rest of it, you're going to figure out on your own. I'm not worried about you. He said, you guys will, he goes, I know Tiger, I know you. He said, I have all the faith in the world in you, but it's not going to be easy. So, you know, here's what, here's what to look out for. Here's sort of, you know, here's my experience starting a company, et cetera. And, and that was really what it, how, how it started out. I mean, it was truly bootstrapping on a kind of crazy level. Did you write down those lessons? I didn't at the time. I, yeah. I didn't. We, we just sat there and talked over lunch. And, you know, it's come to think, I take that back. I'm, I think we had a notepad with us. I'm going to actually say we did. I, when yeah. I think back on it, I didn't thought about it until now until you asked me. But, yeah, I think we actually did. In yeah. fact, I know we did when I think back on it. That's so funny. I had not thought about it. So I'd be curious, did you make every one of the mistakes anyway? Because most founders do. Yes, I, I'm sure we yeah. did. You know, I think yeah. back on it and it's like you, you learn through that. But, you know, you also, we, we had this sort of mentality that you kind of never look over your shoulder. You just keep going forward. You're going to stumble. You're going to have these things happen. But, but for whatever reason, I think probably because it was this or do something else, right? It was this yeah. or you know, I, I was either going to be in real estate. I'd looked at sort of uh, securities, things like that, doing that, but it was also me working somewhere for someone. And, and when we wanted to do it, we were really, you know, I think in the spirit of anybody who's in real estate too, you're entrepreneurs, everybody is. And for us, it was this sort of, uh, you know, there's no option to fail because the alternative wasn't something that we, we, any of us wanted to do. It, it just wasn't. So, but yeah, after that, it was, the story gets pretty crazy because we found this tiny office space you see we work nowadays, right? Well, there's this, this little yeah. building called the office suites in Marina del Rey. And the space actually had about 40 companies in it. And our office was so small, the Tiger would work from home. Luigi and I were in this little office with a fax machine and us. That's all that would fit in it. And it had shared conference space. So it's very much what you see today in shared work environments. Yeah. And it was the greatest experience we ever had. We were there for about six months, but it set the foundation for us so it was so, um, sh I guess you'd say shaking or whatever. You'd, you'd see the companies there. Most didn't make it out of there. Yeah. A, lot, a, a few did. The ones that did often got VC funding. They would burn out very quickly because they blow the money on God knows what. Yeah. And so we made the decision. I remember the conversation. is like, you know, we got to build something that's tech-based, but it has to be brick and mortar-based at the same time. It can't, be, it, can't be it can't be just one. If you go pure tech at that point, Every company, you were right at that part where the crash yeah. was starting to happen. You're seeing the company is failing. It, it, it wasn't the right move. So I was like, how do we build a brick and mortar company, but actually with, you know, tech and do the right things digitally with it? Um, so that was the idea. And the crazy part of this story is we're there for about six months. Every day we'd go down for lunch at, uh, at this, uh, the, it, down in the Marina del Rey area, down at the, at the Venice Pier, at this place called Cino Trattoria. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it down here, but good Italian food, we'd sit yeah. there. 
yeah. across the streets, this building, it says for lease at the top of it. It's right at the end of, of Washington Boulevard at the pier. And so we walk up there one day, Luigi and after lunch, like we got to go look at this place. The doors open, they're doing some construction. So we walk up there and you could tell us this converted sort of uh, duplex apartment. And as you walk up, this guy's standing by the window. Um, he has board shorts on, t-shirts, probably in his mid fifties, late fifties at the time. And he walks over to us and he said, uh, you guys like the space? I said, yeah, it's amazing. He goes, well, I'm the landlord. You want to talk to me? And I said, uh, yeah, I said, uh, we cannot afford this. There's no chance. I go, this is, uh, uh, we probably haven't made as much already as this, this rent's going to be for this place. And, and I remember his exact words. He said, uh, what do you guys do? I said, we do website design. He, in his French accent, he goes, ah, creativity. He goes, I have all these effing attorneys, all these effing accountants that want this space. He goes, I want creative people here. You're going to have the space. And this space is, it, it's iconic in Venice. It's just the most beautiful spot. It looks right out of the ocean. Stunning. This gargoyles in this building, one of the oldest buildings in Venice, um, built in the very early 1900s. And I said, there's no way, you know, we can't afford it. He's like, we're asking 4,000 a month. I said, no, it's, it's, it's not going to happen, but we love the space. Long story short, he said, I'm going to give you the keys. He said, you're going to pay me rent when you can. And for the next two years, um, he covered our rent as we built the company. And he said, this is what the landlord did for me downstairs when I started my restaurant 30 years ago. And he said, I want to do the same for you. I always promised myself I would do that for someone. And he would have me, he would cut us a check for 4,000. I would give him a check back each month. So he could actually show his business partner that they were getting rent for the space. And uh, we repaid him in year three and four, I believe. I think it was three actually when it really took off. But without that space, without Pierre, who is literally like a father to me or a grandfather to me or whatever at this point, he's, he's true family. Yeah. Um, we wouldn't be here today. I mean, he was that space in, in, back then in the tech industry, you had Silicon Valley and NorCal, but Marina Del Rey was the hub for tech in SoCal. Yep. And in the community here, in the uh, whole tech world, the lowest number you could have on Washington Boulevard was the most prestigious number and kind of was this sort of a uh, thing in the tech world in, in LA. And we were 12 Washington Boulevard, which whenever we tell people their jaws would just drop and we just stumbled upon it. You know, it was just one of those things that we had that luck but we worked our asses off, man. It was, there was no shutting off. They were 16, 18 hour days, year in, year out. I mean, it's just, you know, but that's, that's what that's, it was. That's the game. Okay. So there's so much to unpack in all of that. But first of all, I just love that your partners are Tiger and Luigi, right? It's like, I'm, I'm picturing like a Mario game right now, right? Like, you know, I'm not sure which character John would be, but, but yes, right? Uh, the crab. It would, you'd be the crab. <laughs> We definitely, we're going to have to Mario Kart sometime together. Yes, Tom Ferry does occasionally play a video game. I suck at all of them. Just ask my boys, right? Don't even get me started. Actually, the only game I actually can play well is Madden Football because I run the same four plays over and over again and I use the Rams from last year. That's it. That you switch to any other team, I don't even know what I'm doing. Like, I'm not a video game person, in case you're wondering. <laughs> Tristan's looking like, what? It sounds like we I'm play like, about just as much. Same thing. It's usually Madden or it's usually like Call of Duty on occasion. And it's like, it's been years probably now, so I'm going to play anything. But. <laughs> okay, I'm going to be totally honest. I have tried to Call of Duty twice. And in both cases, all I did was shoot the sky and then I got hit. And I was like, this is stupid. Tom Ferry, this is not the highest and best use of your time. Get out of your son's room and go do something productive. All right. So, so, you know, you talk about the early days, you know, I mean, listen, you know, all great entrepreneurs have these like interesting sort of like just good things happened. Right. But then they all worked 16, 18 hours a day when you guys launched back in 99, did you launch with websites? Cause I remember the cost of building a website in 1999. When I, hey, when we built the MikeFerry.com website, right, when I was running my dad's company in 1995, I think we spent like four or $500,000 to have that thing built, right? I mean, could you imagine? But so, so give me context. It's 1999. You guys start. You guys decide, hey, we're going to do web, web design, right? I know. Every entrepreneur knows. Like, they're, oh, okay, it's a website company. Okay. No, 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 no. You got to build a company. You got to build HR. You got to build culture. You got to build hiring. You got to build training. Are you using insort or outsource, right, to actually do all the work? You got design. Oh, by the way, then you have client experience, client care, billing, receivables. Oh, are we going to ever get a paycheck? Like, I understand this. 
right? I think most people, like, it sounds so glorious for most people. Oh, huge company, fastest growing, you know, Inc. 5000. Everybody that makes it after 20 years is an overnight success. Who, tell me about how you guys divided and conquered. Were you all three working on the same stuff all the time? Or do you are like, hey, man, you got sales and, and interface with clients. You got design. You got run the back office. How did you guys do it? Yeah, you know, it, first off, I'm so grateful there were three of us, you know, and, and John and I talked about that to this day. He said, you know, that's a testament. He said to have three partners still together after 20 years right. is, he said, is almost unheard of. He said, that is a testament in our chemistry. You know, over the years, I mean, the first few years, I mean, Tiger and I was kind of physical fights at times on, he was a total visionary and the person yeah. who, you know, and I was the conservative finance person who's like, okay, my rule was we can try anything we think can work that we all agree on. It just can't be fatal. So the idea was we can run up to the line, but whatever that decision is, it can't be something that could possibly be chaos or, you know, set us back to where we couldn't recover from it. That, that was yeah. kind of my rule with things. Yeah. Beyond that, we all sort of fell into our roles. Luigi was probably the most fascinating because Tiger had the graphics background. You know, he was, he was responsible for a lot of John's marketing and a lot of the print side of things. So web was, well, a, a transition, it was one that was, you know, you can master, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. Luigi was an engineer by trade. This guy self-taught himself HTML, Flash, anything. Yeah. I mean, Flash, you remember, right? Like back in the day, of like course. those yeah. were the things. So he self-taught himself so much. So you would have the three of us when we started where Tiger would be sort of the creative person, you know, for our site, other sites were developing. Um, you know, I'd be the person sort of, I fell into a sales role with no sales background, which I was laughing because I was like the worst closer ever. I was great at developing the relationship, but you know, it's a friendship at that point. So it was hard right. to ever, you know, ask for the money and that type of thing, which was kind of hilarious, but. Which is hysterical. Cause you also said you're the finance guy, right? So you're like, holy crow, we have no money. And this person wants to buy. Should I ask you to buy? I feel uncomfortable asking him to buy. <laughs> you know, do you know, Hey, do you know Mark Roberge? Uh, no. Okay, so Mark, uh, so Mark and I have worked a bunch together. I've, I brought him to some events. He was the co-founder of HubSpot, and and it's a very similar story. Like there's the four the four founders, and you know it's like the one super you know super visionary, the one who is like just the absolute best at engineering. There was the one that was like killer at finance, and Mark was also an engineer. And they're like, you do sales. He's like, I don't I don't do sales. I'm an engineer, right? I was out there scraping email addresses off realtor.com because you could cut and paste one at a time and sending out like 50 per day or something. And we got our first clients, so it's kind of funny, but this, the story is, but I mean, it's- Oh man, it you was, would, it, by the way, you would get in so much trouble for doing that stuff today, right? Like that is just so no-no, like that's just absolute hack city. Yeah, no, totally. And, and it was, but it was just, I still remember those days, I end up, you know, a funny side story of this. So Tiger was a gamer. And when I, yeah. when I say gamer, he was one of the top 10 ranked in the world for a game called World of Warcraft at the time. Oh, yeah. Like he was yeah. amazing. So this is what we were dealing with because Tiger would game all night and then we'd have to get designs done for clients and things. So we're waking this guy up at 11. Like Tiger and I are just, I'm like, uh, you up yet? Because uh, we need some designs. We need this sometimes. So, so the, uh, the deadlines were less. We would make them, but it would be like by, it would be like, it, all the stories. And 12 Washington, so the office we were in, that place, the back of it, had a separate room when we first got it before we kind of converted into more office yeah. space. It was only 1800 square feet. So that room at one point, Tiger's brother lived there uh, for a bit. Luigi was living there for a good half a year. I think it has a shower in it. He'd have a surfboard. So you go surfing in the morning and uh, we were, he would literally cook lunch. Like we'd have leftovers from Versailles or whatever restaurant out here. And Luigi would be heating up, you know, lunch at around 11 in the morning or 1130 and making leftover or whatever we had and just yeah. eat at the conference table and, it was, yeah, those are memories that, you know, we had the office till 07. And the crazy thing is the only thing that I saw out of COVID that was, you know, sort of a silver lining in this, which is a strange coincidence, the both tenants, the restaurant, and, which was downstairs and our office became available about uh, six weeks ago. And Pierre and I, we talked several times a year, we get lunch. I'd happened to check in on him and Jean Guy that day. Um, and I said, how are you guys doing? He said, we're good. He said, you know, five minutes before he called, I got an email where the tenant uh, is moving out of both spaces, uh, citing COVID and they can't stay in business. Would you want the space again? I said, you gotta be kidding me. Cause we outgrew it to that time. And I was like, sure. we'll never get a shot at this place again. And 12 years later, we're, uh, we signed the lease about a month back and we're uh, building it all out into a kind of cool media center and uh, conference center and just kind of hang out area for 
our team and everybody else because it's it's home. I, that place is more home yeah. to me than my house is. Yeah, well, that's like when you hear the stories of like you know Jobs going back to his parents' house where they were building you know the early apples you know inside of the garage, right? I mean, it's the the garages of America are like the great story of like entrepreneurs, right? Henry Ford, etc. So in this case, the garage was you know twelve Washington in Venice. So fast forward to today, just for for context. So the three of you, you know, just going crazy, doing everything. And I want to go back to some of those early days because there's, there's always a lot for every entrepreneur to unpack in the early days of their career. But give us context today. How many full-time employees and like, you know, what, what's the business look like today, right? You got 20,000 sites out there with all these agents and brokers, but like what, give us like context and let's go back to the early days. Yeah. You know, uh, currently 300, about just over 300 employees. Um, this time has been so strange, right? Because obviously everybody's, you know, dealing with the same pandemic, the same things going on at this moment in time. And, you know, I remember when, when this took place, we sort of, everybody I think was shaken, you know, immediately sort of shocked and, you know, because business stopped, everything stopped for a moment in time. Yeah. And I remember looking, it was around March 15th, if I recall, and we just sat there and I was like, you know what, let's see what happens because, the next week's not going to tell us, I don't think, but I said about 10 days out, we're going to know because people are going to have to adjust. Yep. The media is doing what they're doing with this, which is the usual. So I was like, you know, it's, it's going to be. No, you, no, no, no. We're amongst friends. Ready? The media didn't blow it out of proportion. They scared people to death. Absolutely. Right now, listen, I don't care if you're a news fan or not. The news is only job is television's only job. It's to get you to continue to watch so they can sell advertising that's what they do right so sorry just side note i couldn't agree more they yeah. look for that i mean that's yeah. really what it was and you know you, that's a whole separate conversation but you yeah. know it's, there's parts of quotes to use parts that aren't and it it weaves a terrifying story and yeah. you know you had this so i just said you know let's watch people are going to have to adjust yeah. acclimate but i said i think this isn't going to be a recession by fault of you know massive financial institution collapse no. it won't be this no. this is gonna be something different that's going to be born out of a health pandemic and a, and a you know this is this has an end and people don't want to be in this nobody chose no. this this, this no. wasn't we you know this isn't seven eight nine this is a health crisis that became an economic crisis yeah. massively different yeah. Absolutely. So I, we just kind of looked at it. So let's give it so to, to a day when I called it, I said, let's watch the Thursday of the following week. And yeah. all of a sudden that day, people started inquiring and, and in droves, people started yeah. contacting. And I said, this yeah. is going to be that moment. And I yeah. said, so we just watched through the end of, I think it was two days left in March, every week of April would pick up more and more and more steam. You know that we in the 20 year history of our company had the biggest month ever in the month of April of this year, which I am again, you, you can't help but be grateful because you've got so many people on a team that you've built over the years. I have people who've been with us for literally 16, 17 years, um, 14 years, tons of, you know, our culture is something that we kept and maintained yeah. from that beach office and from yeah. that moment. So people genuinely care. You can't put a price Hold on. Does, So does that mean that everybody has Italian food waking up at 11 o'clock in the office after they surf? I'm just No, not right. exactly. But uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I just could. I couldn't help it. Yeah, you can. You can help it. Luigi, Luigi's not there cooking. That's his full time job now. He's just making lunch every day. <laughs> yeah, but not not to make light of that. I I do want to know. Um, and I do. I'm going to go back to the beginning. But you know, but you know, we can all be a little entrepreneurial ADD here. Um, what would you say were the three to four uh, best pivots or moves you made? The first one being, don't react. Let's wait ten days. You know, like what else did you do? during that time. Like I, I think of what we did cause you know, we like you had a, like a very healthy month of April, which, you know, a lot of people we know in our space that work with real estate agents, April was horrible. May was horrible. And, and look, I think, you know, both of us, you know, right. Great teams, great culture, great clients. You make strategic adjustments to be relevant and to be current. And just some people didn't. So I, I want to know, like, what did you guys do? You know, we already had, um, you know, a, a probably about, we had a fair amount of our workforce already work from home uh, or work yeah. remotely. Even people who started here that moved to Las Vegas or moved back east or moved to Arizona, all sorts of different places. Yeah. So that part for us, since it's so, you know, and you're, you're, I'm sure you kind of can relate too. you're virtual and digital in a sense to begin with. So right. it's not the, it's not as big a step for so many people who, who aren't, you know, that, that for us was not the hardest adjustment. I think no. the biggest thing we did is we stayed in touch immediately. Like we were 
talking to everybody, you know, sort of constantly sort of updating them. And we're very transparent, like what we were thinking, what we were doing, we made okay, it with, there. with your clients or with your 300 full-time employees, employees with every, yeah. with all of our team. Yeah. yeah. We just let yeah. them know, here's what we're thinking. Here's the plan. We, we made it through 08, 09. We've been around, like we, we know that was the experience that experience yeah. 10, 12 years ago, there's no substitute for that. And I will tell you, I, I, that's the one thing I tell you living through that, going through that, there's it prepared us for so much it changed yeah. how we did business how we thought yeah. of things yeah. um you either learned from that or you died it was pretty much one of the other as a company you you had to adjust and adapt extremely quick um extremely quickly and this time was no different it was just one of those things where it's like okay what could we have done different back then that we learned from that we could implement now how would we approach things differently you know what would we have looked like 12 years ago that we can carry into this and come out as, as good as possible. And every week I was just telling people one, how grateful I was that, you know, people were contacting us and inquiring because you don't know what that's going to be like. You know, even if you, I knew we were something in this time where people needed, everything was going digital, social media, websites, everything. Right. Yeah. So anybody who thought a website wasn't important, you know, a year before or half year before all of a sudden is realizing, okay, that's now how people are going to see me, view me, uh, things like that. So, yes. but I was just so grateful because there are so many other companies and as you alluded to and said that are out there that didn't have that experience, you know, that, you know, we were just very fortunate and, you know, I told, I told the guys all day long and, and the team and I said, this isn't about our product necessarily anything else. It's about stuff that we did over time that got us here. It's about that we cared that we actually built a business that was built correctly and that was built you know, with a lot of heart, soul, and passion. And yeah. I said, you know, that's why we're here 20 years later. That's why in this moment, people are looking to us to help them. I was like, be so grateful and thankful for that because there are so many companies out there today that their entire livelihoods are, are wiped out overnight. You know, they're, you know, closed in that you, you're, you're, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, social distancing. You can't go to restaurants. What about them? What about, there's so many people, catering companies. I, I was thinking of everything at the time because I, you can't help but think that way when, every business you walk into, you think like a business yes. owner, you, 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 you know, it's like, mm -hmm. I always tell people, I relate to the wait staff far more in a restaurant than I do the owner. Cause I was that person. I'm still that person who wouldn't ask me to do something that I'm not going to do. Yeah. Um, so that's how your mindset is. So you just can't help but be like, okay, we are in this moment. Be grateful. We're here in the position we're in. What can we do to like really do some cool stuff to turn people's brands around in this time and bring them online and help them sort of, embrace technology because technology you know is 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 scary at times and there's so many options out there it's like how do you sort through and sift through um you know what's what's useful to help you build your business and your brand and what mm -hmm. sort of noise so yeah so so sort of crystallizing you know 315 hey let's wait 10 days you were already prepared for work for home which a lot of people weren't and we you know like you guys we were ready like everybody was on you know we had to get everybody on slack where it was just yeah. maybe key people on slack Oh, hey, we, we probably need some more laptops. Let's go get some more laptops. And, you know, I mean, I have two people you know, in the office today and my assistant. So there's four of us in 45,000 square feet in the office, which is just hysterical because um, everybody's working from home now. Um, the touch points with your team. I'm looking at my own team. I mean, that, like like that, like I said, you just you have to over communicate. Right. We had I over communicate with my team. We're going to be OK. We're going to make through this. This is not like seven, eight, nine. So I totally relate to that. Um, but what else? What did you do differently for your clients? Did you change your marketing message? Did you change your approach? Did you change pricing? What else did you do, you know, to, to I don't know, if anything, to make sure you kept the business moving forward? Because that's, that's the message I said to all the agents. Stay safe, keep the business moving forward, and load the cannon for the future. Yeah. You know, our, it was two things happened out of it. The, I, right when it happened, in the, the, it's on our homepage or our website right now, but we just, I thought about it, I was like, there's a campaign to be had here that needs to be put out there that says, and we put it, it said, the world just went digital. Is your website ready? Because to me, if people understood what, what the landscape was now, more than ever, you had to make sure, and not your website only, right? But all of your, your social media, anything online had to, had to present a consistent message across every channel. In other words, you couldn't have your social media looking like one thing or your website looking like another because before often it's mailers, listing presentations, things like that. And the website is important, but it's not always everybody's priority. And now everyone's going to be there looking and everyone's going to be looking you up online. They're going to look at reviews. They're going to look at uh, your, like I told people right away when I was on panels immediately, the first thing I turned to, I said, 
check your social media, like go through it and make sure it looks professional, but approachable. It can't look manufactured. It's got to look authentic. Uh, it's got to portray who you are because when they finally do meet you at all of this or even zoom you or whatever it's going to be, yeah. it's got to, you've got to be the person on social media. You can't be the person you made up on social media that you thought everybody wanted to see, but then you're not that person when they meet you or talk to you because it's over then. Um, and so it was more just sort of the clients we talked to just coaching them a little bit and sort of saying, here's things to think about that you might not have before this, obviously. And here are some things you can do to adapt. Um, you know, you, you know, as well as I do, social media is probably the most inexpensive form of advertising in a sense for the farthest yeah. reach. It's yeah. unreal. Um, yeah. And if you actually leverage that, you know, intelligently and, and sort of um, pragmatically and, and get help to do that if you need it, it's such a it's such a huge thing because you're staying in front of people constantly, even when you can't and everybody's staring at a screen. That's what I would tell clients immediately in, in email campaigns. I was like, you, everyone needs to know that right now they're just looking at screens. They're not seeing you in person. They're not, but they are looking at their screens. I assure you that everybody's glued yeah. to a TV, a computer, tablet, phone. I don't care what it is, but they're staring at the screen um, and remarketing everything. I mean, you've got to be following them around to different sites, to different places. That, it was just that. It was like, how do you leverage the digital aspect that you might not have been leveraging at all or, or as much before? Because that's what was yeah. out there. So, uh I know you met uh, Jason Pantana, who leads our Marketing Edge. He talks in Marketing Edge, it's attention versus acquisition, right? Which is like brand versus attraction, right? But, you know, it's, it's and so much of web, uh, web design, like it was interesting, I was looking at this stat um, the other day. On average, the third most viewed page on a real estate agent's website is the About Us page, right? And, and when I think about, how many of those pages I've gone to? Because, you know, like I'll do a session with, you know, someone say, hey, oh, you know, they won yesterday. This gal won, uh, you know, 45 minutes with me, right? So I, I go to her website and I'm not going to say her name. I click on the about us and I just about threw up in my mouth. Now, you know who you are. Please don't be offended because I did tell you that and we're going to make changes. But like, like I see that all the time. Like talk about the mistakes that you see agents making. So, so whether they're your client or they're not, they can go back to their web developer or, or just be able to say, hey, look, these four things, these five things have to be done right. What are, the, what are in your mind on the attention and branding side of, of somebody's website? And then I wanna talk social, same thing. What do you think are the four to five biggest mistakes you see when you look at websites? Um, I would say, it's, there's, there's, we see so many different things. I, I would say the homepage of your website should tell a story. Your brand has got to be present front and center. Um, the biggest mistake I see probably out of everything is whether you, whatever platform you decide to use, right? You have to make sure that it can convey your brand. In other words, you know, there is a use for templates and stuff. How we have them, you know, even in our kind of our, our, you know, entry level and sort of mid tier products that you yep. can build off of, but they have to be really brandable. It can't just be something where, because you got to realize whether that's now or whether that's a listing presentation in the future, whatever it is, if you look like everyone else, if you look like sheep and you don't stand out, there's nothing that's going to differentiate you to make you memorable when you leave. But your website's actually a great place to do that. Because yeah. to me, if your brand is conveyed from the get-go, right from, a, we call above the fold, right at the top of the site, and yeah. you scroll down and that homepage tells a story and it does it engagingly enough. Um, you know, I think it was NAR or realtor.com. Somebody did this study back in, it was years ago, probably five, six years ago, people judge a website in less time than it takes to blink. If you can imagine that. For sure. So the second somebody gets there, they're going to decide whether they trust you, let alone with the most important transaction of their life um, to stay on that site, whether it engages them enough to continue, they're going to bounce off that site in a, in a heartbeat if it doesn't grab their attention and if it doesn't come off as professional. Um, so I'd say that one of the bigger mistakes is just taking it for granted and not realizing how important it is as, as simple as that sounds it, it's yeah. it's it's that's You're, it would you agree that for a lot of agents the their website certainly you know the the top of the fold is the validation you've come to the right place i am the right gal i've got the right team i know what i'm doing so so if number one is tell a story on the home page why me versus the competition or how i can serve you write your story what's number two what's the two number two biggest mistake you see biggest mistakes I would say just clutter, um, you know, have a purpose to the site. A lot of the time, what I see is people trying to do too much um, yeah. in a, not an organized fashion. And what happens is if you, I mean, it's kind of marketing, right? Like, but if you don't draw their attention to something and they're drawn to everything, there's no focal point, there's nothing. Then again, you lose the user by simply overwhelming them with information. Um, yeah. 
you know, break it up, use beautiful imagery, use, you know, mix text with that. Don't have a, nobody's going to read. I don't care how you do it a thousand words in a row stacked no. together. Um, you know, use on a, on a bio, use bullet points, use highlights, use the kind of stuff that what might about come a video? Off the what about a video? Video is huge. I mean, video is now is everything because again, that's how they're going to meet you first. It's, it's that first connection has got the site, the site you have, I tell people this, it's the one thing you control, right? Because you don't control reviews online, be that Yelp, Homelight, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. You don't control a lot of these things, but your website, you can, you, you can spin the narrative however you want to and convey your message and your brand however you'd like to. Yeah. So that, that's probably the biggest thing is, is that. It's, it's, it really is your place to sort of tell your story, make it engaging, make it captivating. Um, pay attention to detail. You know, that's another thing too. It's don't think any section of your site should go sort of... Uh, it's going to go unnoticed because if they are interested in you, they're going to search through that whole site. You want that to be as consistent as possible. You know, back in the day, people used to like link out to all sorts of things and everything. Keep people on your site. You know, there's yeah, no need yeah. for that. Don't, don't drive them off. Okay. So tell your story too much clutter, not enough purpose, right? What's number three. What's the number three biggest mistake you see? You know, one of them, and this is, and sometimes I think when I tell people this, it comes off as self-serving, but we're not remotely the only game in town. So I just tell people, and this probably would be number one, because when people ask to about purchasing website, whether it's us, whoever they're contacting, I tell people own your website. And, you know, we've done a campaign on that, but it's so important. We started out in the early years, 2000, 2003 or four, when we first built Agent Image, the product line and stuff. And we had sort of a, I call it a rental model, right? Like a, you know, sort of a template model that you, it's great for scale, but we retired it around 08 because we just got tired of telling people no. Um, the challenge with any system that is proprietary, that isn't open source, right? Like basically something that any developer could work on is you could purchase a site, build, start building a site, build your brand, but if you don't own that website and one day, whatever happens, right? Like that company goes out of business, um, their customer service starts to falter, the prices go up, whatever else. I've seen clients literally invest 10, 20, 30, $50,000 in a site they never owned. So when they decide to leave or they've hit a ceiling of what that proprietary system could do and, so, and they can't get what they need, they're literally starting from scratch. And you see people who built SEO values through Google, who've done all yep. this stuff over the years, who have amazing organic rankings. Um, I was working with one in, in uh, New York right now that the migration cost to port the site over is greater than the website cost. She books for every term imaginable, top three. You know, those are, those are even scary to do transfers of, right. but you can do them. But to do that, whereas if they just developed on WordPress or they just developed on some open source platform that has thousands upon thousands of developers worldwide working on it, if that's the case, you literally push a button, it migrates it over, it's done. So it's one of those things where you never, and I think, you, I think it's any of our businesses, right? You never want to be dependent on another business for your business. And that's the best way I've always put it. You know, there are places that model works. CRMs are great for that. Yeah. IDX solutions. There's a lot. I mean, even, you know, you look at uh, Dropbox, you look at Salesforce. Right. I, I, mean, I was going to say, as you made that statement, I'm like, wait a minute, man. Like, come on. Like, you know, look, I mean, Salesforce, Slack, uh, Outlook, Gmail, like, you know, like we don't want to, we don't want to create all those. But you don't want to own that. No, you do not want to create that. Actually, so. actually, I would love to own all <laughs> yeah, of Yeah, you'd love to own it. <laughs> yeah, I would love to own all those. <laughs> yeah. But, you don't want to build them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and look, I remember sitting with uh, with a couple top clients, not to be named, because they would probably you know punch me for this. But they were all like, and just you know, they're like, I don't know if I even need a website anymore. Like, you go to my Zillow page, all my listings are there. My my the map of my track record, you know, a video on me. So I'm just you know now obviously all of these agents are wildly successful and they all have their own sites. Um, and in many cases, some of them don't even advertise on Zillow anymore. And yet they still get a ton of business because they have feature, featured listings and everything else, right? Um, so number three is on your site. What's number four? Um, let me think on this. It's so funny. Mistakes. I, I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna share one, and you tell me if you think I'm like full of it. Here's one of the mistakes that I see all the time. Hey, coach, um, I'm redesigning my website. Uh, what do you think about this? I'm thinking about this. I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about this, and I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Who's your Who's your developer? Who's your designer? Which company did you go with? And and I think the trap is, um, it's like my buddy Mark Davison, right, from Thousand Watt and Brian. Like a million years ago, we partnered on this agent branding uh, design business. 
And it was super fun. Like we were helping all these agents redesign their brand. The biggest challenge was we would say, we'd spend three hours, you'd interview everything about them, right? You would know like the colors that would match them, the energy that they bring, you know their story, you write their story, and we say, okay, here it is, and they're like, yeah, I showed it to my husband, he didn't like it. Yeah, like, and I see the same thing with agents with, with websites, right? Like, oh, I showed it to my sister, she didn't like it, and I'm like, oh, well, uh, did your sister work at Young and Rubicon, or, oh, no, no, but you know, she doesn't like the color purple, <laughs> right? Like that drives, that, that drove, I think that drove Mark and Brian out of the, out of that business for a while, even though they have come back and now they have a whole new product that they're doing for agents. But I, I know it drove them insane. What's your take on that? It, it's, it's interesting because, you know, we started out as a branding. I, I always say that even though it's kind of the buzzword nowadays, but we were a branding agency first and foremost. That's what you are. When you're doing this, you're, yeah. you're literally building logos, business cards, yes. websites, yes. everything. You're building someone's entire basically yeah. image, if you will. And how do you get their personality? How do you can, you know, and, and then when you do it, you know, we used to have this joke, right? We'd say, if you had three design concepts and you were to give them to someone, and you had one you didn't quite like, you're like, ah, it's marginal, but I'm gonna give it to him just to see. Without fail, somebody would pick that design. And it was like, it, it's this running joke because it, it almost yeah. happens universally. Yes. So to your point, yeah, it's what we learned over time was you just basically have to be as forceful and direct as you can. If you know something is right, you, you know, defend the design. That's what we always said. If you have a design yeah. you know is lights out, the brand is lights out, it's good, you've got to do your best to do that and explain, Hey, well, your sister might not like this. Your husband might not like this. Please trust us on this one. Like we, we're not going to miss. We've been doing this way too long. Like we know it yeah. looks good. We're not going to do you wrong. You know, just, just put your, put your faith in us. We're, we're, that's, this is what we do. And you know, and this is, as you put it, right? Like, you know, it's uh, our, our, our inspiration. If you think back to when we started, where a lot of, there were companies, these names might be familiar, like Razorfish, March 1st, there were a lot of these design firms, yeah. right? You yeah, right back in the sure. day. And they were all handling these major accounts. We started outside. Hey, I go, remember, I got started in 1989. Hobbs and Herder, right? Like, do, you know, are you competing in an agent with a brochure like this? Or do they just show up with like their business card, right? And I was like, oh, that's a good pitch. They sold a lot of brochures. Right? Yeah. No, that's, and, and we, and we, you and I were geeking out on a conversation a while ago, but you know, all the, all the companies, Advanced Access, D57, all these companies have been yeah. around since that time. Yeah. But, you know, it's like the ones that are still here. It's pro. They're still here. I, I, there's ones I have a lot of respect for just from a duration standpoint. You don't, you don't last this long here if you don't have no. something that people like and it's useful right. and it helps people. And there's so much sand in the sandbox. Like I'm, in our take is, you know, there's different products that meet different people's needs. And, yes. you yeah. know, you just want to build something and work with someone that you trust. That it looks professional. It conveys what you see your brand to be rely on people to assist you with that, you know, trust those that probably have done it for a long time. If you can, you know, it's, I'm not going to go try and uh, nowadays try and, uh, you know, list or, or buy my own house without a real estate agent. I'm not going to, there's certain things I look to experts for that I know I'm not going to be that person at, you know, and this is one of those things where you just try and, uh, you know, just try and, uh, you know, convey that and say, Hey, trust yeah. us. We're going to do right by you. Yeah. Trust the process. This is by the way, a good lesson for every entrepreneur watching. that's not in the real estate business. It's once again, man, you, you find what is that product market fit, right? Who is my ideal customer? We look at like the TAM, the total addressable market, right? Like what's the TAM? And do you really think you're going to get everybody? One of the big mistakes that I see is too often. I, I see an agent on a website basically say, I'm good at everything. You with me? I cover everywhere. And, and like marketing 101 is like, if you're for everyone, you're for no one. What do you stand for? What are you about? Like, who do you serve? Who's your model match client? Like I tell people all the time, like, look, if you want to sell 25 homes a year, you don't have to talk to 10 million people. You just got to find the right 25 people that vibe with you, right? That can be a part of your tribe. But you might have to kiss a couple frogs along the process and know who you're not for to be able to say, uh-uh. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's what I said to my, you know, my old partners. I'm like, look, we're not for everybody. The person that says, no, I demand that yellow is my color, <laughs> right? <laughs> that we're like, oh, okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe you should work with someone else. All right. So, so I want to go back to the early days and then we got to be mindful of time, right? Because we're both, you know, busy running companies and doing our thing. But this has been interesting. We bounce all over the place. I want to go back to the conversation you had with Tiger and John Arrow at lunch but this time I'm gonna put it on you. You're now talking to somebody that is starting a new business. 
and you're going to say, look, man, you're super talented, right? Like, girl, you know what you're doing. You can build, you know, I'm thinking about like uh, our buddy who I saw what happened tragically to her store, the matcha, right? Yeah, Geraldine down in, sorry, I'm, I'm in the middle of a podcast having a conversation with Brenda, my podcast producer. So, John, so often, right, the, the, the person knows what they're good at, but they don't know those mistakes. So what would you say are the two or three biggest mistakes knowing what you know now? in starting a business, what mistakes would you avoid? Let me think about this for a minute. Um, you know, it's so strange because so this is the interesting, you know, it's not even to avoid the question because I'll answer it, but it's, I don't think I would change a thing. That's the crazy part. Like yeah, yeah, everything yeah. that we yeah, went through. But you're, but you're giving the advice to somebody else. Somebody else. Um, what would I say? Hey, John, I want to start my new company and this is what I'm going to do. What mistakes should I avoid? I would say, well, funny enough, what I would tell anybody, which I tell real estate agents and anybody all day long is mm -hmm. be mindful of your brand and how you build the name, the brand, everything from day one, um, yeah. because you don't want to be changing that. You want to keep that consistent. But I think really, you know, try and this sounds silly, but if you, and it sounds simple, but just try and always do the right thing. If you, I've had mm -hmm. this where I've always believed that if you do right and you build a business ethically yeah. to sort of whatever, the money's going to come along. Like if you're passionate yeah. about what you do, but if yeah. you're going to start something, love it. Like if you don't love it, don't start it because yeah. you're going to, you're going to be putting everything into it. You're going to sacrifice everything. You're going to sacrifice time with friends, family. You're going to sacrifice your own mental and well-being, probably from lack of sleep and everything else to points. You're, you're going to grind so hard that it's going to seem completely overwhelming and impossible at times. You better love something to a lot. You better have a lot of passion for something yeah. If you're willing to give, make those sacrifices, because that's just, you know, John and I would have this conversation a lot, you know, and we, we had the, we hung out in Laguna beach. I think it was last summer for four hours. We just sat and talked and it was just so crazy because, you know, I'm this kid looking up to him and all of a sudden we're having these conversations where we're two separate sides of the industry per se, but like, mm -hmm. it's so intriguing to have sort of reflect on, you know, his company over the years, our 20 years doing this and, you know, looking at that, it was really, you know, just, yeah, I, I, I'm trying to think how to put it into words, but it was really just doing the right thing through and through and loving what you do because I watched him and I watched how much he sacrificed. I knew it. I knew it from a family perspective and everything. You know, we, yeah. we have these conversations. If you build something that is successful, that's going to be successful, that you're going to put that much into, that comes at a price tag. And it's sort of this unsaid, sort of unspoken yeah. price tag sometimes but it's going to be those hours to take away from time with it could be kids. It could be again, family and, and friends and, and things you enjoy doing hobbies. Um, you know, make time for yourself enough to stay healthy and to take care of yourself. Understand there has to be balance. If there's not balance, you will burn out. Um, I had burnout. I had burnout after 10 years for a bit and it, it took me sort of recharging and realizing, okay, I got to step back in this and really, you know, charge up for the next round. But this time around, learn to delegate to people you trust, surround yourself with good people, hire people better than yourself, truly. And I mean that hire people yeah. smarter than yourself, better than yeah. yourself. That's what you've got to do. You've got to try and find, and you you said earlier, you're going to kiss a few frogs idea. You're going to, you're going to bump into people who, whose motives aren't as pure as yours, whose intentions aren't. And that's okay. You know, you just got to be able to recognize what, what business it is that you want to build and, and who you want to surround yourselves with and what you want that reputation, that image to be. Um, you know, early on, right, the first few years we did this, there was a, a huge market for porn in, in the web industry, right? And we had a simple rule when we started, if we can't show our parents, we're not doing it. And it was that simple rule, yeah. but you're tempted by all this stuff because there was tons of money in it. The easy money or the, the perceived fast money, no doubt. And it yeah. probably would have been, but to what, you know, what's your soul worth, right? What's your integrity yeah. worth, right? And yeah. that's, it's no knock on that because I mean, people do that and make money, that's cool. It's just one of those things where, we had a vision for this. You know, we started doing general design. We were doing Resnack Auto Group here in LA or the Jules Stein Eye Institute at UCLA. We were doing a lot of these prestigious sort of cool businesses. And we just saw this huge void in the real estate space. We're like, there aren't any pretty sites. These are all, you know, and it wasn't knocking those companies. We just had such an idea of what design and brand could be that, you know, we, we thought there was a, there's a huge void here to be filled. We can really step in and do some stuff. We, we had no idea of growing to what it did. You know, we were, you know, three people, five people, seven people. And then truly within a year, I think it was probably up to 80 at some point between 04, 05 when, 
you know, when the housing boom took off and everybody's doing real estate and people saw our work. So, but yeah, no, I, uh, that's, I kind of veered off topic a little bit for you, but. No, but are you into kind of, you know, mistakes to avoid to then, you know, the mistake to avoid is maybe being too generic and not being, uh, here's my narrow niche, you know, become world-class at, at one thing and really own that space versus, so I mean, I, you know, if you're going to do something, be the best. Yeah. That's my take. That yeah. was my, if we're, if we're yeah. going to do it, we're going to put that much blood, sweat and tears into it. Yeah. Be the fucking best at it. Like don't, don't yeah. settle. Don't, there's no point showing up if you're just going to be, you know, also ran or something else. Like yeah. how do we do stuff? And we'd set that goal. Like our, our mission statement back in like 07, when we were like a little more, you know, in that corporate growth vibe was like, you know, be the best web design company in the world. And that was what we would say. And it's like, but we had so many people who were inspired by, and we yes. knew the work we were doing. And, you know, I had a client ask me today, he was presenting me to his team to do a kind of a talk to, he had 40 agents on his team. And, and when he was, he, when he introduced us, he said, would you say, he said, I'd say you guys are the best website design company in the space or the industry. And I said, if you asked me that a few years ago, I maybe would have questioned, I think there's some other really good ones out there. I said, now, yeah. I was like, what we do. And that wasn't cocky. That was just pride in how hard our guys worked, what we built, the team we built, the clientele we have and, and how much we care. I was like, you know, we might make mistakes along the way here and there, but I guarantee you we're going to care more than anybody else will when we make them and we're going to make it right. And that was, that was always my philosophy. Nobody's perfect, yeah. but do right by the client or the person as best you can always. And, you know, again, good things should happen. And for, yeah, people starting a business, that would be my advice. You know, just try and find good people to surround yourself with. Um, find people as passionate as yourself or as close to that as you can find. Because you can't, like you said, you can't buy that. You can't buy an ownership mentality. You yeah. can't, you know, and you find those people who really genuinely care and want to do something special. And if you care that much, then yeah, it should, it should, it should work. There's every chance of success, but that way it's just, just a lot of uh, grind and hard work and perseverance. And Love it, man. Love it. Well said. So, so listen, as we, as we wrap up this interview, you know, for my friends that are out there listening, you know, if you look at all the people that I'm mentioning, Geraldine, right. And, or my buddy, Steve, who started Nectar Juice Bar and, uh, you know, Connor McCluskey, who started Bomb Bomb, they all tell a very similar story. Love what it is that you do because you're going to have to work your face off and put so much of your life into it. Now, you may stop and say, hmm, maybe just maybe that's why I'm in this position. I don't really love what I'm doing, so I don't put all my time into it. And yet I complain that my business isn't where I want it to be. Something for you to think about. Maybe go back to the podcast I did about my mentor, Mike Vance, and answering the, the five fundamental questions. But John, I know I'm going to see you uh, coming up at our virtual success summit this year with tens of thousands of agents joining us. Um, I'm always proud of you, man. Just, you know, you guys do good work. You help a lot of clients. We share, obviously, a lot of mutual clients that, uh, that you know, we're blessed to both work with. But, man, thank you. Thank you just for opening up and revealing who you are and what you're about and sort of your, your thoughts around design and the business and websites and agents and, you know, being a founder and all that good stuff. So I wish you just unlimited success, my friend. And, you know, check out agentimage.com. Uh, John, what's your social handle? Where should they follow you? Uh, I, I, agent image pretty much like I, I'm this, the funny thing with me is I'm, I'm so busy. I, I'm not on social lot. I have my, you sound uh, like real estate agents that I talked to you, John, hold on. I'm holding you accountable to this. You can you can, man. It's funny because my assistant, everybody gets on me. I was like, I got actually working on that. So yes, but no, I did. It's cobbler syndrome. Truly. Like we, I'm so caught up in the stuff that it's like, you know, agent image is Instagram. I mean, that's what I would follow, but it's like, yeah, I, it's the cobbler, it's the cobbler, the shoemaker, right. The, you know, the shoemaker son. You're too busy working on everything else for your clients and stuff that it's the one thing that like, yeah, it's, it's uh, it, it, do as I say now as I do on that one. So, but yeah. <laughs> I'm just looking at Brendan saying, maybe we should just go right now and just swoop up everything. Uh, John crab, like all across all social channels and we'll just sell it to him later. <laughs> I, I just updated my LinkedIn today. It was pretty funny, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's that stuff needs, uh, needs some love here and there, but yeah. Yes. So. All right. I'm just busting your chops, partner. All right. All good. So listen, everybody, we thank you so much. Uh, leave us some comments. Let us know what you think as always keep moving forward powerfully. I'll see you. Uh, I'll see you or you'll hear me next Wednesday on the podcast again. Take care.